Welcome to the first open global civil society consultation on the International Migration Review Forum organized by the Civil Society Action Committee. Over the past year, we've come together for learning and sharing through GCM objective webinar series and the People's Migration Challenge. But this is the first opportunity that we have to prepare for collective civil society self-organizing towards the IMRF in 2022. And today we will review initial civil society ideas, expectations, and strategies for our engagement in the IMRF. And these inputs will then be presented to member states, the UN Migration Network, um, the President of the General Assembly's Office, and various other stakeholders in a series of dialogues over the next 12 months. And during this two and a half hour session, we will have a team of co-facilitators who will guide all of us through this um, discussion. My name is Cecily Kern. I represent Mercy International Association, and I'm the vice chair of the NGO Committee on Migration. And I will let my other co-facilitators introduce themselves. Okay, thank you, Cecily. Uh, I'm Marta uh, from the Major Group for Children and Youth, uh, which is uh, the Migration Youth and Children platform, um, and where I serve as the global focal point for migration. Um, thank you. My name is Salma Makitiko, and I work with the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and I'm based on the US-Mexico border. Welcome to the space. Great, and we have one more co-facilitator co who is experiencing some technical issues, but I, we're hoping that Don Tolentino will be able to join us um, later in, in the meeting. So our meeting today will be split into three main pieces. First, during this opening plenary, we will get some context as to how we got here and where we are on the road to the IMRF and hear summary reports on GCM implementation from each region in terms of what has or has not been accomplished since the GCM was adopted. Then we will move into breakout rooms in Spanish, French, and English to enable all participants to engage in a substantive discussion on civil society benchmarks for GCM implementation and on IMRF modalities for civil society participation. And finally, we will come back together in the plenary to share the insights that emerged from the breakout discussions and to identify key messages to present to member states in future meetings over the next year ahead of the IMRF. And just a quick note, just in case, um, to any member state delegates or UN agency staff who've registered to join us and who might be in the room, so to speak. Um, we appreciate your interest in our discussions and respectfully ask that any non-civil society participants limit yourselves to observing our meeting, recognizing that this is an important space for civil society self-organizing and sharing, and we will have many opportunities in the next year to engage in dialogue and discussion with member states, UN agencies, and other stakeholders ahead of the IMRF. But in this space today, we want to make sure that civil society voices are central. And with that being said, we have a very full agenda and we're looking forward to a rich discussion with all of you. Each of you brings such valuable insight and expertise and we're excited for this moment to reflect, but also to look forward to the future, to set our ambitions and um, to organize ourselves for meaningful participation in the IMRF. So I will pass the floor off to Colin Raja from the Action Committee Secretariat to share how we got here and what's coming up with the IMRF. Thank you so much, Cecily, and thank you everyone for joining us. We appreciate you um, being here with us together today, and we hope for a very uh, robust and very exciting discussion today. Um, I, I'm going to go through really quickly some of the, um, the roadmap uh, in terms of the IMRF, which we will start with kind of talking around um, what the IMRF even means and, and how do we get there. So I'll just go through this really quickly and I, I apologize to many of you who are very well versed on this and, and uh, please bear with me as we make sure that we all come to the same um, basic understanding before we launch into our discussions. Um, so as been mentioned before, the Global Compact for Migration was adopted in 2018, uh, at the end of 2018. And in, in part of the Global Compact, 
um, it was indicated, it was negotiated and um, agreed that there would be an international migration review forum, uh, that's what we call the IMRF, um, every four years. So the very first one uh, since 2018 is, is the one coming up next year in 2022. Um, this is scheduled to take place in May of 2022. Um, just a couple of more things to mention about the IMRF is that technically it comes under the, um, uh, the jurisdiction of the General Assembly and so will be chaired by the President of the General Assembly or the PGA as we refer to sometimes. Um, so a lot of the procedures will be following uh, the General Assembly procedures. Uh, and final thing to mention is that most likely the um, IMRF will take place in person uh, in New York, where the UN headquarters is uh, for the General Assembly, for most procedures of the General Assembly. So um, that is the expectation that uh, we will have an IMRF in person. And so that's one of the things that we think will be important to uh, review when we uh, discuss and, and go through. Uh, our discussion today. Um, so just two things we wanted to, to talk about when we, uh, as we jump into this consultation. One is uh, with about a year to go, so next May or so, so a little less than a year to go uh, for the IMRF, the Action Committee um, uh, members have decided that um, we should launch into a process for the, for the year. And with that, we started to uh, look at, uh, first of all, doing a survey on what civil society would like to see in terms of preparations towards the IMRF. So I'll ask my colleague, uh, Martina, to help us share the results of this survey. Thanks, Martina. Um, so the, the survey, which we had about almost 100 um, responses to, just gives us an example, an idea of um, uh, some of the, the indications of where civil society is, mm -hmm. or how it's thinking about and how we're um, planning to approach um, the IMRF. Uh, just to give you an idea of, of who responded to the survey, um, you know, we had a good coverage around the globe. Um, but interestingly, uh, we had a, most of the uh, responses coming from uh, Africa, Asia Pacific, um, and organizations that are global in nature. But we also had organizations from uh, other regions as well, probably the least of all, uh, but still quite, quite significant, about 10 respondents uh, from the North American region. We'll go to the next question we asked was like, what are some of the main thematic priorities um, that each organization is focusing on. Um, in here, we can see the green one, regular pathways and irregular migration jumped up right to the top. Um, and then the um, purple one, yeah, that one right there is on social protection for migrants. Those two really jumped to the top uh, in terms of the current issues, uh, but also a number of other issues have jumped to the top as well, um, got quite high, uh, focus as well. And you'll see that in terms of some of the things that we propose to discuss, and certainly not the only things we propose to discuss. Everyone is welcome to discuss uh, any issues related to the global compact or any critical issues related to migration. Um, but some of the things that we have been proposing, we start to focus on, uh, are based on some of these responses so far. So we'll go down to the next one, Martina, please. Thanks. Um, so between now and um, next uh, May, sorry, we said June or July, but it really should, uh, will be in May of next year. Some of the prep uh, activities that each organization plans to organize or, or participate in. Um, the first one is, of course, this, something like this, uh, participation in consultation. So the, but also participation in consultations at the national level, that's the first one, and then participations uh, in consultation at the regional level. Um, that seems to be really, really important to everyone. Uh, and then that red bar also is in terms of advocacy with government. So that's another thing that we will begin to fo focus on and discuss uh, how we advocate with governments collectively. And then also thematic consultations or workshops uh, related on specific thematic issues. So a, a lot of prep activities amongst ourselves, the discussion amongst ourselves, um, uh, before we even discuss with governments, but uh, talking to governments is very, very high on our priorities list. We go down a little bit further 
in terms of the activities described, um, who is interested in participating in self-organized civil society processes and activities towards the IMRF at the global level, um, such as this one. And you see overwhelmingly about uh, two thirds of people said, yes, uh, would like to participate and receive more information about that. And then almost the rest uh, said, maybe my organization would like to participate. And then in the IMRF itself, um, you know, what's your participation like? Um, most organizations, about half organizations said maybe my organization would participate in person depending on, on resources and capacity. Um, and then that blue one, uh, which says my organization is planning to participate directly in the IMR. So a vast majority do plan to participate or hope to participate uh, based on their resources. And then towards the, the next question, now, in terms of those participating in the IMRF, what's your organization's accreditation status? And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in a second here, but accreditation to participate in an in-person general assembly meeting uh, that the IMRF will be under. Um, about, um, I'd say, what is that? A little more than a quarter said my organization has ECOSOC status. So that's good. Uh, but also the orange one that says my organization does not have ECOSOC status, but hopes to uh, hopes to get accreditation. That's the, uh, the orange one uh, underneath that chart there. Um, so we'll apply for special accreditation. And then the green one, we will rely on the accreditation of a network that we belong to. So we'll see that um, you know, more than half of the organizations do not have ECOSOC status, hope to apply for some kind of uh, special accreditation for the IMRF or are relying on someone else uh, for their accreditation status um, uh, as part of the, a larger network. And that's something that we will also discuss in the modalities in a second here. And what should be the main activities of self-organized global civil society uh, prep process such as this one? So consultations, that's what exactly what we're doing is the first step towards that. And then the green one is advocacy meetings with government. So again, these two issues, even at the global level are, are very important. And that's why we're focusing on this. Um, we also have people said that, yes, we'd like some um, dialogues with the UN network and other specific UN agencies and preparation of joint reports and um, other, other inputs. So we also hope to support uh, that kind of work as well. Um, and I think that's one more question. Yes, thanks. Uh, what do you think should be the main outcomes um, it's for advocating for civil society engagement in the IMRF? I'm uh, sorry, that the green one's engagement in GCM implementation. Um, and then the blue one says uh, addressing gaps in GCM implementation. So very much related, um, both, of, both of those. And then the red one uh, is advocating for strong civil society participation in the IMRF itself. So, um, and that's what we hope to focus on in the breakout uh, discussions today. And then will your organization submit any reports or written inputs to the uh, IMRF? Um, but more than half at this point say maybe, I think a lot of people are still planning on it and then discussing that possibility. And some already have said yes. Um, and then others and saying not really about the quarters and not really, but uh, hope to participate uh, through others. So I, uh, and that has one more last question here. I'll just touch on that. Um, oh yeah, so I think that's all. And the others we asked for specific inputs, uh, documents that you have already. So this is based on, everything that we've shared so far uh, in terms of the survey. And this is how we hope to focus in. So I'll just switch for really quickly for a second here and um, sort of share the um, uh, modalities resolution of the IMRF and focusing on some key ones that we, we hope to uh, engage in in our discussion here. I hope you all can see that. Um, this is the, a copy of the modalities resolution and uh, I hope um, it comes out clearly for you. I'm just going to scroll down to where it really, the, the substance is here. Uh, as mentioned, it's part of the General Assembly, comes under, the, shall be chaired by the President of the General Assembly. It will be for four days, it'll take place for four days. It'll probably be somewhere around May of next year at the UN headquarters in New York. But let's jump down to paragraph four uh, and the highlights here. Um, 
it calls for the effective participation of all relevant stakeholders in the forums and invites non-governmental organizations that in consultative status with the um, Economic Social Council, the ECOSOC status, um, as well as stakeholders that were accredited to the preparatory process uh, of the intergovernmental consultations of the GCM, so the negotiations and the consultations, and then were accredited to participate in the intergovernmental conference, which is the Marrakesh conference, as, as many of us call it. Um, and these two aspects are really important in the, in the modalities and how to participate. Um, for those who don't have ECOSOC, if you have ECOSOC status, that's great, and you know who you are. But if you don't, but you did participate very actively in the negotiations of the GCM or participate in, in the Marrakesh conference, um, you had to have gone through an, uh, a special accreditation process for those of those uh, for both of those things. And if you did, and this is something we really, really advocated very strongly for in the negotiations of these modalities, um, these are two things that we did get as a win for us, um, that it was agreed by member states, we could get uh, accreditation to participate in the IMRF if we already uh, were participating in the GCM negotiations or the Marrakesh conference. So just to remember that in, in our discussions uh, as we come up. How that's going to happen is still a big question, but that's that's something that uh, to keep in mind. Paragraph five, representatives of relevant NGOs, academic staff, uh, and so on and so forth. And here's a whole list of other organizations, uh, relevant stakeholders uh, are then called upon. But um, here's, a, here's an important clause to that. Um, this list will be submitted to member states for their consideration on a non-objection basis. And some of you are aware of what the uh, UN refers to a non-objection clause. It's become a very popularly used uh, procedure uh, in the UN uh, General Assembly. What it means is that any member state can actually um, object or, or can uh, ask to take out uh, a certain organization from that list of participants if they are not comfortable with it. And it's up to them on a voluntary basis whether um, they want to give a reason on why they should be taken out or not. It hasn't been used so far, but it is certainly something that has been used. It hasn't been used so far in our processes, but has been used in other processes. And it's something just to be aware of um, that there's this non-objection clause in spite of you, know, you having received special accreditation before or having all the right credentials uh, that are necessary. Um, the, Modalities resolution, of course, calls for a whole of society approach, but there's a couple of other ways where you can also engage uh, with the IMRF. One is through the regional economic commission's preparatory processes, and a number of you have already gone through the regional reviews, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and all other, um, sorry, with the involvement of other relevant stakeholders, so that, that calls for any engagement you've had in the regional economic commission's regional reviews. Uh, paragraph 11 also refers to the Global Forum on Migration and Development, which includes the civil society business and mayoral mechanism. So uh, again, he has an opportunity to engage through the GFMD, and we hope to get more clarity on how that will play out in the next few months, uh, as the GFMD is also discussing their inputs to the IMRF. But certainly we hope to engage civil society uh, through that process as well. And the final thing to touch on is that the um, there will be an interactive multi-stakeholder hearing one day prior to the IMRF, which means that uh, a day before there will be uh, a stakeholder hearing, which includes all of us. Um, and and the, the report of that stakeholder hearing, there will be a representative of civil society will present a summary of those hearings. So when it says the representative of civil society, it all really means a representative of all stakeholders. Uh, non-state stakeholders. So there will be one representative that will be selected to present a summary of those hearings. And that's something we will discuss and who that person is, how that person is selected and what we think about that. Um, again, it uh, highlights in the opening plenary of the, um, of the IMRF that there'll be one representative from the migrant community and a representative from civil society who will also speak uh, at the opening plenary along with the PGA, uh, the Secretary General, and the Director General of IOM. Um, so those are the main things we wanted to touch on. Um, oh, just, I'm sorry, I forgot one more thing, adequate space for reserve during each roundtable for participation of non-governmental stakeholders. So this is something we should continue to focus on and insist on that we, 
we respect this part of the modalities that um, other stakeholders, uh, not just governments, can be given space at the discussions in the roundtables. So that's all we wanted to um, share on at this moment. Um, so with that, I turn it back to Cicely. And I will pass right on to Marta. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. And thank you so much, Colin, uh, for, um, you know, for placing everything within the roadmap. So that's, that's really helpful. And I think basically, yeah, moving forward, I think now in the rest of the agenda, we are uh, going to hear from um, hopefully like one representative from each region that can give us a bit of a summary on or a short report from the regional migration review forums. Um, and so we're, yeah, we're going, we're starting with Africa for, first. Uh, Mamadou Goita, I think you should be in the call from the Pan-African Network in Defense of Migrants' Rights. Um, so if we have around like uh, 25 minutes total. So if you could keep it to five minutes, um, it'd be great. Thank you, the floor is yours. Is he in the call? Okay. Yeah. Uh, is is in there? Um, Mamadou, if you're trying to speak, you're on mute. Let's see. All right. Yeah, we can hear you. I think a bit quiet, but we can hear you. Okay, because I was losing the sound. Okay, no, you're, you're back. We can hear you now. Okay. Please. Hello, everybody. So very quickly about the process that's... Uh, can you hear me? Because I have really problems. Yes, can loud we can hear you well. Okay, good. So just uh, talking about the process, um, because we, are, we have been organizing a couple of uh, pre-meeting, uh, trying to set up the different or different issues uh, related to the um, assessment, and um, uh, and uh, at the Pan-African side, but also we had uh, 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 some sub-regional meetings uh, with uh, West Africa, but some of them also are taking place very soon just to allow to go uh, for the Pan-African uh, meeting in, uh, in, uh, in Morocco and the 12 and 13. And so, so far, so we have been dealing with uh, different thematic issues and then produce some report that allow to understand what's going on in different country level, but also at uh, a sub regional and Pan-African level, just to allow us to understand uh, the key processes. So actually so far we are having some thematic consultations in addition to the, uh, the global process in the continent, in the, in the continent and then going to uh, have this uh, finally our uh, process uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in July, uh, uh, in July 12 and, and 13. Um, what else can I say? So there are some independent group, so the, the, the Pan-African Network in the Defense of Migrant Rights have decided to have an independent uh, uh, assessment process that we'll do on uh, July 1st with uh, our membership, but also open to other groups so that we can have a chance to discuss some of these issues and feed also the process, uh, 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 the process with uh, uh, some of these uh, review uh, 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 issues that we have been discussing at country level, but also as a, as a Pan-African network. Um, so I think briefly, this is where we are uh, having we, we are open really to have to receive all of you during this uh, July 1st meeting. Uh, so it will allow us to have a key discussion uh, beside all the global process that we are having with, uh, with states uh, so far. Uh, and I know that there are many challenges related to the participation of CSOs in some of the meetings due to the fact that uh, information is not well shared between Different, among different groups, and we are doing our best that to allow to have this kind of process that will uh, uh, really motivate our membership to participate in the process. Um, yeah, I think that I will just stop here uh, because I didn't hear some of the last part that we have been uh, speak, talking about because of uh, some of the problem I have here in the internet. And if there is any additional point that you want me to raise, I, will, I can just uh, jump on it. 
No, that's great. Thank you so much, Mamadou. And I guess if there's any other like organization or stakeholder from the region that would like to add anything, you know, feel free to do that in the chat maybe so that we can move on um, to the next region. So I'm just going to open it up then um, from a representative from the Arab states, uh, civil society. So I don't know if there's anyone here who was, um, I imagine there are someone, there's someone here who was in the Arab states, uh, participating in the Arab states consultations. So if, yeah, if someone would like to, maybe it doesn't have to be anything very elaborate, but just hop on and, you know, say, say a little bit about how the process was and uh, what kind of points were raised. So yeah, I'm opening the floor. You can raise your hand or just unmute yourself. if there is anyone from the region. If not, we can move on to the next. Um, don't be shy. I'm trying to see, but yeah. Okay, great. So I guess we'll move on to the next, but if someone else from um, the Arab states uh, discussion would like to raise some points, feel free to just raise your hand. We can call you after. So moving then to Asia Pacific, um, Elana from MGCY, um, could you give us a bit of an overview? Hi everyone, thanks Marta so much for the floor. Hope everyone's having a good day so far. Um, I'll try to cover as much as possible in the nuances, but obviously we're constrained by time and um, I'm sure other people in the region know that this was a, a complicated process that, that had a, a few challenges within it. Um, so please reach out if interested or would like to hear anything else. Um, the, the the regional meeting for Asia Pacific was held in March, 10 to 12 March. It was a three-day hybrid meeting in the end, hosted by the Economic and Social Commission for Asia Pacific. Um, and I'll briefly touch upon the process leading up to it for anyone who wasn't there, wasn't aren't aware. Um, so in addition to, to this meeting itself, there were five stakeholder consultations hosted by ESCAP leading up to the main meeting. They were spread out from October 2020 to March 2021. And for each of the first four, ESCAP sent out a call out for applications for stakeholders wishing to co-organize roundtables within each consultation session. Um, they clustered GCM objectives together to make it easier for roundtables to go forward and for civil society and other stakeholders to participate and make their perspectives and priorities known. Um, for the fifth, that was seen as a summative sort of session and ESCAP re requested applications from stakeholders to co-organize and host it together. Um, and this was largely stakeholder led um, and, and was a very dynamic discussion that resulted in four cluster statements, which were then presented at the at the meeting itself. So um, the stakeholder participation in the actual meeting um, was rather limited. There was um, one speaker at the inaugural, five delivered these short cluster statements, and then four were allowed to make um, interventions at the round tables um, if there were time. Um, and I'll go through a few of the civil society priorities, the main ones that were captured in the four statements. The summary is published on the ESCAP website, and I believe that I will have also been circulated before. So feel free to reach out if you would like to see the full thing. But these are some of the, the key, key priorities that were brought up. Um, first of all, the recognition that many migrants continue to live in marginalized society and excluded based on migration status, particularly within the region. Um, COVID-19 amplified a lot of the structural obstacles for protection, inclusion, and participation. Um, and a lot of solutions were exposed as not have not being adequate, especially in times of crisis. And particularly for vulnerable groups such as women, children, sexually diverse, trafficked and irregular migrants. Um, there was also a key focus on the vulnerabilities exacerbated by this pandemic, um, need for migrant access to public health services, labor protection, tech and connectivity resources, protection against xenophobia, and an emphasis on both in transit and destination countries. And in, in short, a few of the, the, key, the key priorities that were brought up as well um, was migrant contribution and recognition of it. Um, there's a recommendation to states and authorities to develop um, more data-driven inclusive narratives um, to encourage greater recognition of positive contributions by migrants and not just um, xenophobic narratives that, that quite a few of the countries in the, in the area still suffer from. 
also recognizing the need for social and economic inclusion, um, particularly ensuring that states adopt and implement legal frameworks that, that, that ensure compliance with IL core conventions on migrant workers and their families, um, the need for greater consular assistance and protection, um, also for um, further education and framing education for migrants um, with development and workforce capability lenses, recognizing the benefits for further education for both migrants and their families for such sustainable integration development in the region. Um, and then also that states must then prioritize initiatives that promote inclusion and unity um, through sort of building back better. Um, however, even though there was a lot of very good priorities that were brought up um, and a lot of, of synergies um, across stakeholder groups, um, within the meeting itself, there was, uh, I would say, um, a, a lack of concrete actions that really came out um, in terms of commitment from, from states, um, further commitment to to the GCM by member states as well. And the, the, the region still suffers from our, um, a disparity between different member states in terms of um, friendliness to, towards migrant protection rights and frameworks. Um, it was also worth noting that at the opening ceremony, there was a, um, some issues that came up um, with stakeholder engagement that was made clear to member states. Um, a significant network of civil society organizations withdrew from the from the review meeting at the start um, during the opening ceremony and they emphasized the importance of meaningful migrant participation at the meetings and expressed dismay that there was a lack of transparency um, at this and also the migrant voices throughout the meeting itself and then there was a statement released by another group of participating civil society organizations who wish to also make their perspectives heard as well as the major group for children and youth also released a statement these were all shared via the mailing list and if you'd like to see them again please feel to reach out and a few short reflections from our side um, sorry Marta this is a little bit long um, but that um, there was a lot of uh, challenges um, in designing a new process um, in terms of you know changing travel restrictions and trying to create a hybrid model um, and although many stakeholders went to great efforts to create meaningful participation there was a lot of issues around transparency of uh, reasoning decision making from on stakeholder engagement um, there was a lack of meaningful inclusion uncentricity of migrants and grassroots organizations within the actual meeting itself. And there's also a lot of challenges that came about from late changes, complex access requirements and uncertainty um, between both UN agencies and civil society organizations. And so this created challenges to internal coordination and barriers for poor participation. Um, I will stop there. And if anyone would like to add anything further, please share in the chat. Um, I know that this was a very quick, brief summary of what happened, but hope was useful. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, and uh, yes, as Elena said, please use the chat if you are in the process and you'd like to add anything. This is, you know, a place to share. So it'd be really helpful. Um, so moving on then to Europe, I think uh, Michelle uh, from FICUM, you should be in the call. So yes, thank you. You are the floor. Thanks, Marta. Thanks to the others who've uh, gone before me. So. Um, I think it's interesting for us to obviously give these inputs per region and then also to reflect, uh, which I imagine that we're going to do afterwards, on what, do, what do we say as the whole. So following these other regions, um, it's interesting because uh, I actually have the word transparency in my first uh, keyword. I wanted to say four key points. Um, but also I think it's interesting because the Europe one was done, I think it was the second week of November. I literally think that we didn't hear anything about this until the end of September. So we probably had six weeks or so max um, that this thing was organized. And it was organized by the UN Migration Network uh, Secretariat uh, through our civil society liaison, Monami uh, Malik, who actually strongly advocated for this multi-stakeholder consultation to be, in a sense, what we would have wanted it to be, a place where we can talk openly, discuss, et cetera. So I think we also have to look at this one a little bit separately from the other ones because it was done entirely by the Secretariat. Um, the Regional Commission for Europe, a lot of people I can say don't even know what it is here in Europe. Um, so they really didn't play hardly any role at all. Um, so we, it was organized differently. So the first kind of word or the first uh, finding is transparency. Um, I actually think because it was organized by the Migration Secretariat and because it was organized primarily through our civil society liaison, we had a really good idea of what was going to happen at our multi-stakeholder event. Um, what's also interesting in general, I think, for the GCM process and the regional reviews is that we can, stakeholders could make formal submissions. And I was just checking the website now. Um, and so 
for the Europe one, we had 17 contributions by stakeholders who are not governments. So 16 of which were civil society organizations, um, cities um, and regional human rights mechanisms. And the EU itself was also listed as a multi-stakeholder because it's not considered one government. Um, so there were 17 for the EU, but actually there were quite a few for Latin America as well. But in any case, I think what's interesting for us is that we can see all of this on the website. Whereas with the GFMD, for example, there is no formal submission process by either civil society or governments. So in a sense, this is also quite useful for us. And I think something we have to reflect on for next year as well, um, because I think Colin was saying at the beginning, the results of the survey show that um, some organizations are already intend to make a submission, some are still thinking about it. So I think that this is, the whole transparency of it is interesting. Um, the second point is for the Europe regional consultation. Um, actually, UNICE, which is the UN Economic Commission for Europe, includes Europe, North America, and Western, and Western Asia. So um, North America, in a sense, was a little bit left out. There were a couple of very brave civil society colleagues who got on this call uh, because it was, I think it started at 10 a.m. in Europe. So it literally started at 4 a.m. even on the East Coast in, the, in North America. Um, but it, in a sense, left out kind of North America. So that was something negative. And I, I would hope that we would hear from the others how North America was picked up in the other consultations. Um, but I, what, the point that I actually wanted to make in particular about the wide participation is that for one of the first times, we really had the Central Asian colleagues, uh, those based in Russia and in CIS states, um, thankfully, because we also had Russian interpretation. It's something that um, could be arranged, but I would say that their participation was especially thanks to that interpretation and especially thanks to outreach from organizations like ODIR of the OSCE and the uh, Solidarity Center who did specific outreach. Um, so I think it's something we have to consider going forward if we wanna make sure that certain subregions are picked up um, globally. The third point is on context. Um, I think, when we all talk about our regions and we all talk about the themes, I think there's quite a lot of overlap. Um, I would say a key word for our region is violence. At the borders, uh, in detention, absence of firewalls, um, children who are deported um, with no best interest consideration, um, no real regular pathways in labor that are meaningful, family reunification question. So, I think that um, there's a lot of things that came out um, kind of that characterize the region, but at the same time, I think they do characterize quite a lot of all the regions. And the last part, the fourth point that I wanna mention is uh, regional governance. Um, so this is also important for us to consider when we look at the IMRF, because the whole model is based on national governments. And here in the EU, um, there's 27 member states of the EU, the European Commission makes a proposal on migration. The member states in the Council of the EU and the European Parliament have to then negotiate it. But basically then when they approve these texts in migration and asylum law, they're common policy for 27 countries. So there's 18 out of the 27 that have adopted the global compact. But now when the European Commission made a proposal for the pact on migration, they're now negotiating all of this, it'll take some years, but some of the things that the European Commission has proposed go against some of the global compact commitments. So basically my suggestion is we can't overlook regional realities uh, and regional governance realities when we have this model of just states adopting uh, the global compact we have to bear them in mind. Um, and the last just finding was, um, we also saw in the governmental official forum uh, that because it was online, civil society could also intervene in the discussions. Um, so I think it's also something to maybe bear in mind when we look at next year, because that's gonna be in person, or I don't know if actually the IMRF itself will be hybrid, um, but we actually found that very helpful that we could actually intervene. There didn't seem really any barriers. So thanks for that. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michelle, for the summary and for the reflections too. And you'll definitely have more time to go into that and you know what that means for the next year's process as well in the breakout discussion. 
Um, so I'm now going to ask Itzel Polo from Bloque Americano, Latin Americano if you can kindly give us a, yeah, a summary from your region. You have the floor. Hola, buenos días, buenas tardes a todos. Si ¿Sí se escucha. Voy a hacerlo despacio para dar tiempo también a las interpretaciones. Bueno, eh, para comenzar, eh, en un previsto, en un primer momento, la revisión estaba planeada para marzo debido a eh, la situación de COVID. Se informó que pasaría a finales de abril. Entonces, tuvo esto en evento en, a finales de abril. Eh, algunas situaciones que encontramos durante el proceso de revisión es que fue una experiencia realmente desafiante, dado que las metodologías y los espacios donde interactuamos previos al foro incluso no podíamos, no nos permitió interactuar como organizaciones de la sociedad. La plataforma no permitía conocer, visibilizar quién eran las otras personas que estaban dentro y participando. Esto sin duda fue algo que... Eh, causó demasiados problemas e intentamos por varias vías mencionar que nos gustaría una plataforma donde pudiéramos encontrarnos, saber quiénes estaban conectados. Lo sabíamos únicamente por algunas redes muy en concreto, organizaciones que sabemos que participan, pero no dentro de la plataforma. Eh, también hubo partes del, del continente no representadas, incluso podríamos decir invisibilizadas, a pesar bueno, de que esta es una, una revisión regional de Latinoamérica, el caso... Y, y la situación que vive en relación con el Triángulo Norte no se abordó para nada la situación con Estados Unidos. Tuvimos que hablar mucho sobre las fronteras, cómo estas podían afectar y cómo este sería un vínculo para poder hablar de las situaciones. Eh, también sociedad civil en ese sentido no, no hubo una representación. Lo digo porque el bloque bueno, trabaja además en, en, en este Triángulo Norte hasta el sur eh, en, en Argentina. Eh, es evidente pues la falta de indicadores que dificulta que haya un proceso de revisión que permita el impacto realmente, decisiones políticas en la vida de los migrantes. Este fue uno de los grandes desafíos o conclusiones que tuvimos en esta revisión. Algunas prioridades que nosotros identificamos eh, es bueno el derecho a migrar que pueda ser una libre elección y crear las, las formas y la estructura para, para ello. Eh, y, dada las, y la igualdad de derechos para las personas que decidan. Eh, algo que vimos también como una especie de desafío es que muchos de los gobiernos de los estados usan el pacto para hablar o usarlo como una excusa en materia eh, de seguro ordenado y regular para no cumplir con los grandes estándares de derechos humanos. Sin duda es una preocupación muy grande que tenemos o que salió en sociedad civil. Todos hablaban a partir de contención y militarización de las fronteras. Algunas prioridades que identificamos son la implementación de rutas de acción con indicadores de impacto y participación de sociedad civil eh, y permitan el análisis de manera interseccional de género y derechos humanos. Una ruta que facilite los canales regulares que incluya acciones afirmativas en consulados, en los ingresos de punto de entradas, que de permanencia que permita regular y la regularización migratoria de las personas migrantes. Implementar procedimientos de identificación, el acceso e inclusión de personas que requieran protección internacional. Esto hemos visto en varias, en la región tanto sur del continente como en Centroamérica, en Norteamérica, y el análisis para la no devolución. En ese sentido, los objetivos 2 y 21 siguen siendo prioridad eh, para nosotras y también los objetivos 7 y 8 con el tema de acceso a la justicia y verdad y el tema pues, que tiene que ver con la desaparición de las personas migrantes. Es importante facilitar los mecanismos y dar seguimiento a las ya mesas que hoy, hoy en día existen con la UN Network a nivel global eh, porque como eh, comparto lo que dijo Michelle en algún momento, hay una desconexión también grande entre la Youth Network a nivel internacional uh, con la regional. A pesar de que previo a esto intentamos hacer varias reuniones, se hizo un esfuerzo muy grande y los aliados que tenemos en la Youth Network a nivel global, pero falta aún bastante para impulsar eh, una verdadera relación, sobre todo a nivel regional. Generar un acceso a servicios, eh, en ese sentido, el derecho a la identidad y acreditación de documentos en los objetivos 4 y 15 
y bueno, insistir en la no detención de, eh, de migrantes, de niñas y niños adolescentes y no acompañados. Algunos mecanismos que nosotras mencionamos son la activación de redes nacionales de la ONU sobre migración con la participación permanente de sociedad civil, los mecanismos regional para la implementación de indicadores desde una visión regional y que enfunja con actores entre gobiernos, agencias, sociedad civil y las personas directamente impactadas. Eh, otro es necesario promover la migración eh, como un, repito, no como un enfoque de seguridad nacional, sino desde una perspectiva uno regional y eh, para atender las necesidades desde esta visión y no a nivel solamente eh, nacional o supranacional, que en muchos de los casos pudimos observar al ante los estados que brindaron los reportes. Eh, y eh, estamos, bueno, de, desconocemos obviamente aún cómo serán los pasos siguientes. Sabemos que ya se publicó el primer informe donde retoman algunas de las consideraciones que se hicieron en, en la plataforma. Sin embargo, también vimos que no fue una, una revisión como actual, sino muchas veces parecía simplemente que los gobiernos o los expositores eh, daban algún tipo de eh, informe, por así decirlo, pero eh, más como de, que no permitía una interacción y que no hablaban en relación al, a lo revelante de la implementación del pacto. Aún faltan mucho los, los gobiernos por mencionar, además de que nunca supimos cuáles fueron realmente eh, los mecanismos ni la forma en cómo se eligieron a las y los ponentes eh, en términos de sociedad civil, repito, porque no pudimos conocer quiénes eran. Muchos de los que participaron fue porque tuvimos que de manera interna promover o algunas, algunos compañeros, colegas, se dieron sus lugares para que las regiones no se vieran invisibilizadas. Sí fue un reto y bueno, es por ello que el fortalecimiento de la red a nivel regional es una prioridad que, que pedimos desde sociedad civil. Debemos garantizar estos espacios en donde nuestras eh, organizaciones estén con estándares de participación, transparencia, vigilancia y monitoreo con todos los actores y los estados también. Eh, es, es, es prioritario. E insistir en que todos los mecanismos, eh, se creen mecanismos de monitoreo, seguimiento, evaluación para la implementación del pacto eh, y que realmente tenga este el impacto con las personas migrantes, con los más grandes estándares internacionales de derechos humanos y la creación de grupos de trabajo permanentes de, de multisectorial que representen los diferentes actores. Yo dejaría hasta aquí eh, lo, que me, lo que vemos, sigue siendo un, pues un espacio desafiante, eh, pero bueno, hasta ahí Marta. Muchas gracias, Itzel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, great summary and reflection points as well. And I'm now going to pass the floor back to, to Alma uh, to continue so she can introduce the breakout room um, part of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, now we're going to go into the breakout sessions, and we know that as civil society organizations, we play a crucial role of reminding uh, states and UN agencies not to move away from the core principles or mandates within GCM, and, and that uh, we center and help recenter human rights as an imperative for migration governance. So we're going to rely on your wisdom and your contributions to engage into more in-depth analysis on some of what some of the things we want to see in GCM as uh, civil society uh, benchmarks. Uh, or some of the benchmarks we want to see in terms of the GCM implementation. So we're going to ask you to choose some of the following thematic priorities uh, to discuss uh, these benchmar benchmarks and progress. And, and these thematic priorities are labor migration and a new social contract, racism, ethnicity, and discrimination, the tensions and returns, regular pathways and irregular migration, as well as climate change. We have also made some space to, for you uh, at the working groups level to identify some key thematic issues and priorities that may not be within these thematic areas we just propose, because we want to know also about the key issues and key concerns and the specificities that are happening on the ground. 
uh, you may use the following questions as, as guiding questions for your discussion. Uh, I know Martina is going to paste these questions as well on the chat, so feel free to kind of uh, look at the chat just for you to have this in your breakout sessions. And the questions we want to be um, using as, a gui as guidance are what benchmarks should be used to measure GCM implementation? What would GCM progress look like in a national and regional context? And then we're gonna use, we're gonna take about 40 minutes for that dialogue, that discussion. And we're gonna take about 15 minutes to also engage in discussions precisely about the modalities. And, and the word uh, transparency continues to resonate. And so we hope that you bring all the, your analyses and your expectations as to how we want uh, civil society uh, engagement to be in terms of the IMRF uh, process. I think what we're also not really sure of, and maybe we can use the plenary to also understand this better. So some of us were also unsure, is it one rapporteur for the whole multi-stakeholder um, um, session before the IMRF? Um, if that's the case, we can use within civil society some of the processes that we've had previously, where kind of, you know, a group at the global level looks at potential uh, people who could be nominated. Uh, this is what we've done previously for the GFMD and for the two high-level dialogues. Um, but it would be good to be sure that we have a good criteria for even those nominations, that there would be a parity mechanism and that there would be equal representation by gender, religion, eth region, ethnicity, etc. cetera. Um, but I think the other underlying issue is if we have only one rapporteur and the rapporteur overwhelmingly represents civil society, but also represents UN agencies, the private sector, et cetera. How to, how to make sure that, and hopefully that person is a civil society person, uh, that the civil society person doesn't face too much pressure from the UN agencies or business um, to, ta to, to, to alter our conclusions, to make them less polemic, less confrontational. Um, we've seen as civil society how some of the UN agencies have been um, asking us to change what we have as recommendations in some of these documents that the working groups are producing, especially on return. So that's a concern going forward and one that we want to raise. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Nitsa, was there anything that you wanted to add? I think Michelle represents us perfectly well. Thanks. Great. Thank you, you. I couldn't do it better than her. <laughs> I think Very you could, but can. that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I should have I should have stated at the beginning. We have seven groups and limited time. So if people can can um, channel your remarks into about four minutes, that would be amazing. Um, it is important to for us to get trends. So if things are coming up over and over and over again, that is important for us to know. But also if ideas have been repeated multiple multiple times, um, we'd encourage you to. Um, to maybe move on to, to points that haven't been raised. Um, I will move on to the next breakout group, which was um, moderated or facilitated by um, Carol Barton. Thanks. Hey. Hi, everyone. Good to be with you. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kikeli, who um, did the um, rapporteur role for our meeting, but she had to duck out to another meeting. So I'm um, stepping in. Um, I, I wanna pick up where Michelle left off because racism, discrimination and xenophobia came out um, uh, very strongly from many people in our group um, and um, how um, we, we also talked about how do we um, make sure as a measure of progress that the very preconditions for migrants to be able to claim rights are in, their, are in place that if there isn't freedom of expression and the right to organize mm -hmm. and civic space for migrants, then everything else in the compact is not, not going to happen. And so that those preconditions are, um, need to be met. Um, but we, we talked about uh, centering racism and discrimination and xenophobia, but in an intersectional way that clearly includes 
um, gender, class, um, sexual identity and orientation, age and other factors um, that can't be taken separately in the lives of migrants. So that those need uh, to be, we need to work with governments in a way to understand that they aren't just some overarching um, preamble, but that they um, take practical realities in the context of returns, borders, you know, response to uh, access to services, et cetera, and to unpack that. Uh, we said that uh, we didn't get into the more technical benchmarks, but we said that the protection of human rights at borders is cent central um, and the uh, policies of upholding the right to asylum and um, actually measuring whether we've made progress or um, actually gone backwards in that regard. And many of us feel that coming out of the regional reviews that we have gone backwards so that we need to be measuring the, the, the very practical realities of migrants at borders and asylum seekers um, as, as a measure of uh, progress. We talked about the status of migrant workers, access to justice, right to organize, um, and to underscore that regular is not equal to more bilateral contracts, which deny many rights. So that could be measured by some governments as project uh, as progress because they're more regular uh, migrants, but these are regular, so-called regular migrants with um, denial of many rights in tow with those contracts. Uh, we mentioned already civic conclusion and we underscored the need for a new social contract and that that is, um, as relevant for domestic uh, civic uh, um, society as for migrants coming into destination countries, that without that, um, we, we would not be able to address the, the realities of rising xenophobia um, as, as workers are pitted against each other. Um, and that we really need to be contesting the whole concept of managing migration rather than um, uh, centering the human rights of migrants. Around um, uh, what we'd like to see is progress, ending criminalization of migrants, the real integration of the guiding principles as mentioned. Um, we talked in several, several people talked about the fact that in their regions, the GCM is actually being used to reverse rights, that greater coordination of, of countries around migration policy is, um, uh, is setting back the rights of migrants. And, and that um, this is a, a huge challenge that, that we as civil society need to be raising um, in, in very um, visible and direct ways at, at the IMRF. Um, a human rights approach needs to be um, adopted and the EU was one that was mentioned, a region where um, th there's actually re reversals of migrant rights um, in, in um, some of the directives that are emerging. Um, we talked about the security framework um, as uh, a, a major challenge and setback that needs to be cha a challenge because it goes against the spirit of the global compact. Uh, we talked about the pro problematic nature of re regional um, reviews in terms of real inclusion of civil society in a meaningful way and that uh, progress on the compact would be um, uh, a, a real civil society inclusion at the regional level as well. Um, I mentioned this, uh, that the toxic narratives, we would like to see a diminishment of that, but we also recognize that that comes with real system change um, or else those toxic na narratives emerge by pitting groups against each other. Um, if, if there isn't more um, economic justice, racial justice, gender justice in place um, and the elimination of laws that discriminate against migrants. So uh, there's a list here, I won't go through all of it, but we talked about a lot of the challenges. People talked about visas, funding, um, the problem of access to vaccines, if they're vaccine passports, and this is taking place in New York and that we would need to maybe center uh, the ability uh, to give vaccines to, uh, you know, to broader sectors of population as, as well as to, to those who want to participate. We expressed concern about the government right to vet um, NGOs or civil society. Uh, we wondered about how many representatives of an organization would be accredited versus those who could actually access the deliberations, which are usually different numbers. Um, and we wanted a well-funded, organized preparatory process, including at the regional level, to allow meaningful participation of civil society. With the um, rapporteur, we really weren't clear as well whether there's one civil society stakeholder 
or uh, what civil society rapporteur, or they represent all stakeholders. So we want to be very strongly uh, adamant with the, the president of the General Assembly's office that civil society needs to have um, one rapporteur on its own or more, and that business and, and other sectors have, have rapporteurs separately. And that we would urge, even though the final decision may be by the president of the GA, that, that we um, choose our own rapporteur through our own processes and make that recommendation to the UN that we prioritize migrant voices, that echoing the other group that we have um, uh, intentionality about the diversity of representation because that, that will also include who's on round tables, who are the speakers in the opening plenary, et cetera. We would love to see one civil society rapporteur per region to point out the, um, the diversity of realities as well as commonalities. And then we talked a little bit about how um, it would be a huge expectation and burden on one person to represent everybody. Um, and so that that person, if that is what emerges, would need to really come out of this year long process of community building by civil society so that we don't arrive the day before the event at the UN trying to hammer out some statement and, and set of priorities, but that over the next year at national, at regional, and then at global levels, we're building um, that kind of a message and platform. And so that, that then that one representative would be really um, conveying the, the um, consensus of the larger community. That's it. Great, thank, thank you, you, Carol. Um, thank you very much, Carol. Just to remind the speakers, you know, that we have about three, uh, max four minutes for presentation. So at four minutes, we're gonna have to start interrupting you. I'm sorry, thank you. Great, and um, the next group uh, was moderated by Neha. If there's a representative from that group who would like to share, again, three or four minutes maximum, please. Thank you so much. If you can then, Alma, if you're going to cut me off because you didn't cut the others off, can you give me a one minute warning so I can make sure I get the most important points? And we uh, actually didn't have time to elect a rapporteur. So I'm going to start, but I please, I invite anyone else in my group um, to jump in if I, if I miss anything. And just to say, um, because my, our group, we had people working on all of the issues that were presented as possible themes um, that we really felt like we need other sessions where we can dive in on just one topic. And to be honest, um, what we felt um, in our conversation was that um, one of the issues with the Global Compact right now is that there is not an evidence base, there are not indicators, there's not um, um, what's the called, a uh, uh, baseline data um, that's available. And so it is that really hard to evaluate GCM progress without an ev evidence base, without indicators, without baselines. Um, and so this should be something that's a longer term process within the global compact implementation within the um, uh, I4 process to, to develop that. And we wanted to put a question out there if people knew of other processes or systems where such benchmarks and indicators were developed in a very inclusive way that were helpful in the implementation of, of you know, conventions, agreements, others. We talked about the sustainable development goals being maybe one example and there's a way to look at that, but we really think this evidence base is important and that we, there's no way we could have come up with proper benchmarks in our conversation today. With that said, we did talk about labor migration and detention. We wanted to really to talk about climate migration too and we ran out of time and we're asking again that we have more specific sessions to look at these particular issues and that we, we don't have particular benchmarks but that we agree that's a process that's really important. Um, on labor migration or, or some more general things is that we uh, are realizing and recognizing in the regional consultations that governments were just giving small systems fixes to broken systems, and that instead we want to see benchmarks and indicators, et cetera, that really focus on systematic structural and institutional reforms, um, and that we find ways, even though we all work on different issues, to have one, a few maybe top line messages that we support among each other. And so, for example, on the detention side, we talked about the biggest thing is ending detention. And while that it is in the global compact as an aspiration, we talked about that, you know, we should have a top line um, 
indicator and benchmark on what our government's doing to end detention. So even though, for example, my organization works on labor migration and worker rights and not necessarily detention, since it's an easy top line message, I could easily put that message out there too, that there should be alternatives to detention for all and that, that we should move away from that. Um, and so also on the detention issue, um, putting out there the idea that, you know, the pandemic provided an opportunity to think of alternatives to detention and that we saw governments find ways to have alternatives to detention. Um, and so that we, we see that it can happen and that we need to work towards that. And we need to come up with elements and criteria for creating an enabling environment to eliminate detention. So while our top line message would be no detention, there is ways to create an enabling environment for that. And there are elements that organizations from civil society who work on detention know what those elements are to create an enabling environment. For example, uh, having a legal framework in place and that we should be working with governments and other stakeholders over the next year towards the IMRF and elsewhere to develop what those elements and benchmarks are. The same in labor migration. Um, and I see I get one, I get an extra minute because everyone else had it. So um, uh, on labor migration, the same thing. We want, we, we've seen the governments can, when they want to can come up with uh, regularization programs for migrant workers and alternatives, um, uh, alternative regular migration programs. We want to see moving away from temporary migration programs and creating elements and criteria. And again, we didn't have time to talk about them today, but we want to work towards that uh, up until the May IMRF. Alter that how do you, um, uh, what are the elements that are needed for fair migration in, in regular migration programs, particularly labor migration, and how do we come up with the criteria and elements to do that? The last thing I'll say in my one minute is that on the IMRF modalities, we felt very strongly, first of all, that as civil society, we pushed back against the closing space that we are seeing for civil society that we're seeing around the world, but also seeing within the UN. Many organizations have been trying to apply for echo stack statics for years and stay in this amb uh, ambiguous uh, status that they, they, they can't get the echo stack status. And there's other ways that closing space is showing up in the UN. We think as civil society that we need to push back against that. And while we're so appreciative that the action committee and others have pushed for those of us who've participated in the global compact process before to have easier um, access to the IMRF, we feel very strongly that there are other voices who were not able to participate in the global compact up to now that should be able to, and we have to ensure that that's a pro an easy process for them to be able to access any processes that happen between now and the IMRF. And then just the last thing I'll say on my promise in closing and Cecilia, yeah, is that we feel very strongly that there cannot be one representative for all of the civil society, that we as civil society should not accept that, that we should start demanding now that there be more than one civil society representative and agreeing with what others have said that business should be separate, um, other non real, what we consider civil society groups, but that even with, among civil society that we do not accept one rapporteur. And if they refuse to listen to us on this, that we consider, and I'm not saying that our group agreed to this, but that we consider boycotting, that we consider not participating, or we consider other um, alternatives or other demands that we're going to be making because it is absolutely ridiculous to expect millions and millions of civil society to be represented by one person. And we've seen time and time again at the GFMG and other places that it, it is an unfair burden to put on one person and people's issues within civil society get lost. And so we want to have a serious conversation about how we make that demand, that there be more than one person from civil society who's, who represents us at the IMRF and what the consequences of them not listening to us if they don't. Um, and there could be a campaign and an advocacy strategy about that, but we feel very strongly about this in our group. Thank you and Alma, I'm sorry I went over. Neha, thank you. I think this is a common message about, about the civil society rapporteur representation at the IMRF. So thank you again. Um, the next um, group to report back is the group that was moderated by either Martina or um, Ellen Sana. Um, yes, hello. Uh, I think yes, Vanya, hi. this is Martina. I think Vanya was our rapporteur and she will report back. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, perfect. So we discussed um, 
the importance of well, climate change, uh, labor migration, new social contract, but we particularly went into detail with regards to regular pathways and irregular migration. Um, we first discussed the, the need to use proper terms, so the terming of irregular versus undocumented. We went into uh, the discussion of the need of change of narrative around migration and migrants. Um, and then the fact that migration is normally regular, migrants are regular, but become under, undocumented on the way, so to say, um, and that there is a responsibility of the employers um, on that side of this becoming undocumented or losing the status. Related to this, we also discussed the regularization of status. So instead of penalizing those migrants who have, were, you know, in a regular pathway but lost it and then, um, you know, for them to be able to go back, be included in a regular pathway and be able to regularize their status. We also discussed a little bit the difficulty for migrants to access services and basic needs and this was particular in, in, in insight with the pandemic and the militarization. And this is also linked then to civil societies uh, and their um, freedom, so to say, to, to work uh, being limited. Um, and that's more or less it on the existing or desired GCM progress. Uh, we noted the um, importance of migrants to access healthcare, including vaccines. And so in this, we discussed the firewall, the establishment of a firewall between healthcare services and immigration authorities. Um, we also um, underlined, <clears throat> excuse me, the importance of transparency and inclusivity of all civil society organizations um, in, um, in the GCM progress. And in particular, when we discussed country reports of uh, what exactly actually constitutes the content of these reports by governments. Um, and then within, for the social, the civil society repertoire, we, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we thought it would be very important if governments and civil society could be able to suggest candidates to give in names and then that a selection body would be established, so to say, to select and appoint the rapporteur. Um, and that in particular, that also this body, how you say this uh, selection body would also be set up uh, or at le least led by civil society. Um, and then very importantly, that this be a very transparent process for everyone. Um, if I've missed anything, anybody of the group, please do add. I think I still have maybe 30 seconds left. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Vanya. And also, um, if if folks would like to include um, things in the chat, also the rapporteurs have a reporting form and you can add more details um, in that report, in that written submission. Um, next is um, a report back from the group moderated by Alana. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Cecily. Yes, I'll, I'll do a quick report from outside. I'll try not to keep it too long, even though we had a really interesting discussion and quite a, a long one. Um, so whilst we largely focused on labor migration for the first um, the first section, um, we also talked about it in general. And so um, some great suggestions that came up was, oh, bless you, anyone who freezes, sneezes, um, that um, it would be good if there was uh, something really imperative was that there should be a global standard framework with some kind of um, body put forward to ensure sorry, um, in terms of implementing it um, so that there's a framework that can be applied to different regions, but have a sort of global measure of, sort of references um, to, to, for, for countries and also civil society to work together to, to, um, to frame progress against. Um, and the uh, people in our, in our group sort of brought out how this is really important to have sort of as independent from the UN agencies as well, um, because within the member states, um, we've seen how within reporting bodies or, or events, there's been um, certain occasions where they're more um, what someone called beautiful voices or beautiful speeches and, and, and less sub substantive type of um, reporting. And so um, that was the first um, really important uh, suggestion to come up with. Um, also brought up was how civil society itself wants to come to the IMRF and having to um, define our role as civil society prior to, during, after ne the negotiations. Um, what is our role? What is our 
responsibility in terms of um, pushing forward uh, progress do we want to keep sharing things like best practices and and, and target low-hanging fruit or do we want to take advantage of this reset um now in terms of um really pushing for for migration um as, as a gcm and also in context bodies such as the hlpf um as being something really key that governments need to to look at um and so this ties into a suggestion as well um which isn't thematic too, but is in, in terms of a more concrete ask of the civil society mechanism and um, having a concrete timeline or pathway to the IMRF and having um, having benchmarks and milestones for civil society to work towards in each one. Um, I'll go more into some of the suggestions for that, for that later, but that was a, a good point that um, being focused in terms of our advocacy strategy, um, in terms of mobilizing civil society and organizing it, leading up. Um, and a point that civil society in general needs to have a better sense of how countries are respond to GCM, especially in context of COVID, um, so that um, we have a better, a better idea of how they're engaging with the GCM, um, what sort of you know self evaluation and and perspectives they're taking, um, especially now that perspectives have changed since COVID started. Okay. And also, Someone also brought up uh, the need for GCM to be a living document and, and pointing to the IMRF to, using, to use it not just as a review for countries specifically and, and, and globally, but review of the GCM itself. Um, how applicable is it now after things like COVID and also making sure that it's con it continually evolves to be better in terms of gender sensitivity um, and, and responsiveness to different um, crises. Within labor migration itself, um, it was brought up to have a specific platform similar to before as in benchmark to ensure that migrant worker voices are represented um, and, and having, for example, really key um, really key milestones and, 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 and measures such as the right to join or form trade unions and associations. Um, also a mechanism to looking at international level access to justice and migration govern governance. Um, a suggestion was also brought up to compare it to things like the World Trade Organization and why products themselves and trade are regulated, but things like remittances and wage theft are not. Um, and then also looking at how the industry, such as the care industry and gendered migration um, will evolve especially following COVID, um, how will the sector change implement rights and follows human rights principles and how um, civil society needs to be challenging this and making sure that the sector's building back after COVID um, needs to prioritize um, mig migrant rights and human rights in general. Um, there's also a need for benchmarks in areas such as um, the intersections between my migrant health and, and, and labor migration, so such as how vaccine access take up and, and job protection um, um, interact with each other, are migrant workers being, um, being prevented from going back or returning to jobs or being laid off due to not having access to vaccines um, in terms of after, during and after COVID. Um, how has it been in terms of do documentation, mobility, and access to their own documentation and rights? Um, what are the situations now of, of migrant workers who had to leave very suddenly and perhaps left behind um, documents that the employer had and were unwilling to give up or um, were subject to wage theft? And what justice can be pressured to, to, to be, be provided to them for that? And also similarly, and even for a mechanism on protecting social inter integration support opportunities for those who have voluntarily returned and those who are wanting to return back to their jobs. And a need for to, to push um, in terms of civil society mes messaging to have the GCM be paid similar attention that the SDGs have been paid. So um, pushing as civil society for indicators, data and monitoring, and 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 um, and ideally from third third body organizations that aren't led by member states themselves. Um, and also, Lara? sorry, Alana, could you get one more minute on IMRF? Okay, Thanks. sure. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up then because it kind of ties in together now, but in terms of for the IMRF itself, um, a need to, to to make sure that we, we create a strong relationship with, with the train with the transition to PGA um, in the summer, making sure that they understand that civil society needs to be part of the design in terms of stakeholder engagement, um, making sure that we bring forward really solid priorities to both the PGA and to the IMRF itself. Um, 
in terms of um, who has the opportunity to be at the table, making sure that they disaggregate stakeholders in general so that we're not seen as just one, um, one body and even in civil society, making sure that there's specific slots for different types of civil society organizations, ones which want to share experiences and, and are perhaps um, newer to to the, the space, but also ones well for organized groups um, who have very specific suggestions and recommendations. Um, and and to wrap up with that, um, having that um, that be laid out in different steps in a timeline. So, you know, having um, national level uh, mobilization organization of civil society, um, considering things such as um, shadow briefs and reports at country and regional levels to make sure that um, that countries are held accountable when doing their their reporting um, and also making sure that in terms of the civil society rapporteur ideally not having just one um, and making sure that they're elected by civil society themselves um, and not subject to a vetting or approval process that that um, that takes the power away from us and also needing a, um, the the new PJ to know well in advance that we have to understand the procedure and have clarity on this well in advance of the IMRF itself. Thank you. Sorry for being long. Thank you, Alana. And um, with your indulgence, the indulgence of the group, uh, we we are already over time. We would like to go another 10 or so minutes um, because we have two more groups um, to report back and then um, a wrap up closing next steps. So. Um, Thank you for your patience and um, for sticking with us. And I will now pass on to pass the floor to the group, um, the French, sorry, the Spanish speaking group um, that was moderated by Itzel. Gracias. Eh, voy a dejar la palabra a mi compañera, mi colega María Teresa, quien dará, quien es la relatora. Adelante. Gracias, Itzel. Buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, intentaré ser muy breve y los puntos que no pueda poner eh, en este momento los enviaremos por escrito. Algunos puntos claves que queremos que deben aparecer en la implementación es el tema de la regularización migratoria, el empleo decente y digno, el tema de discriminación y racismo, el acceso a derechos, el cumplimiento de los estándares de derechos humanos por parte de los estados, abordar el tema de las detenciones y los retornos y la militarización de las fronteras y cambio climático. Eh, en, la segunda, en el segundo ítem sobre ejemplos exitosos, eh, creemos que el tema de acceso a regularización y, y políticas garantistas son importantes. Eh, el tema de leyes migratorias enfocadas a la protección de la niñez también eh, es un tema crucial. Eh, eh, el tema de trabajar en la discriminación y xenofobia. Eh, abordar el tema de la trata de personas con información para prevenir el delito y promover leyes de igualdad de trato entre migrantes y nacionales, así como la renta básica o algún ingreso básico para eh, los migrantes eh, durante la pandemia. Por otro lado, esperamos que para el siguiente año en el foro eh, se contemple la falta de financiación y el estatus que tienen algunas organizaciones, así como la capacidad que tienen eh, estas para, para poder participar y que sus demandas sean escuchadas y se implementen en beneficio de los migrantes. Eh, también la apertura y la interacción de los estados, así como de la plataforma regional. Eh, un desafío que que vemos es el trabajo en las causas de la migración y el bajo compromiso de los estados y eh, el papel que juega la sociedad civil para atender a los migrantes en primera línea, que eso a, a la vez también limita la participación en este tipo de espacios. También creemos que debe haber transparencia y claridad con la construcción del proceso a nivel regional. No hemos vuelto a tener información de, de la red a, a nivel regional para saber en qué va la construcción del informe y esto nos lleva a pensar en que es necesario el fortalecimiento de la plataforma a nivel regional y el involucramiento de todas las agencias de Naciones Unidas. También queremos poner la lupa sobre los países campeones, cuando en la práctica están siendo campeones en la vulneración de derechos. Eh, también que se debe generar mayor participación de la sociedad civil con convocatorias previas, amplias, generales y sobre todo, que consideren la desigualdad de la región 
porque si queremos escuchar a las personas migrantes debemos acercarnos a las organizaciones de base sin tanta burocracia para garantizar su participación efectiva. Eh, en, el, en, el, en el último punto también creemos que es necesario que exista un mecanismo interno con criterios claros para la elección de quienes representen eh, o quienes sean, eh, eh, bueno, quienes, quienes están en este espacio, por ejemplo, que sean personas de base y también eh, que la elaboración de los informes de los gobiernos deben ser preparado en conjunto con organizaciones de sociedad civil, porque la mayoría están siendo elaborados desde los escritorios, para que eh, se mida los avances con mecanismos reales. También que a, a las agencias a nivel regional informen con tiempo debido para asegurar la participación. Eh, tuvimos un poco de problemas de conexión y le pediría a Excel que complemente si algo mm, se quedó por fuera. Gracias, María Teresa. Um, thank you. And um, I will pass the floor off to the last, but certainly not least. Creo que todo um, está dicho. Gracias, Itzel. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Spanish speaking group. I'm sorry you had, had connection problems. Um, I will pass the floor off to, to the last group, the French speaking group that was moderated by Stefan. Thank you, Cecilia. I will also speak in, I will speak in French because uh, all our discussion was in, in French. So, uh, je crois qu'on on, s'est véritablement focalisé sur uh, la, la migration des travailleurs et surtout sur le lien entre la migration des travailleurs et euh, la protection sociale. Maintenant, pour les, les, les critères qui permettent de mesurer la mise en œuvre de, du, du pacte mondial, on a estimé qu'il était extrêmement important qu'il y ait un groupe de suivi euh, structuré et organisé de la société civile qui sert de, qui sert de partenaire au gouvernement, Deuxièmement, qu'il y ait l'existence d'un dialogue structuré et inclusif à la fois au sein de la société civile et euh, également au sein du gouvernement et notamment que l'ensemble des ministères euh, soit représenté. Et puis, un des derniers critères, il y en avait beaucoup plus, mais là je résume, c'est euh, l'intégration des normes internationales dans le système euh, juridique euh, des États. En ce qui concerne euh, des, des, des exemples euh, de, de bonnes ou de, de, de mauvaises pratiques, euh, on s'est beaucoup focalisé sur l'Afrique et on a dit qu'il y avait eu un très mauvais début, que les, les, les populations africaines n'étaient pas informées, que même souvent la société civile n'était pas informée à, à, à propos du pacte. Maintenant, il y a eu quand même l'adoption d'un certain nombre de, de plans d'action Deuxièmement, il y a eu une certaine prise de conscience dans les pays de transit, comme le, le Niger, où la situation des, des migrants en transit était absolument tragique, avec beaucoup, beaucoup d'abus. Et donc, il y a certaines mesures de protection qui ont commencé à voir le jour. Et puis, euh, troisièmement, un exemple de bonne pratique, c'est la vaccination COVID au, au Maroc. Le Maroc a ouvert la vaccination à tous les migrants quel que soit leur euh, statut. Euh, on a aussi estimé que euh, le COVID-19, au-delà de la tragédie qui était réelle, aurait pu être une opportunité pour qu'on euh, mette fin à certaines pratiques, et ce n'a pas été le cas, et que notamment la régularisation dans, euh, dans les pays européens a été extrêmement limitée, que dans le fond, il y a eu beaucoup plus de retours forcés de migrants dans des situations dramatiques que de, de régularisation. Euh, troisième question en ce qui concerne euh, euh, la participation au, au forum. Euh, effectivement, le, le principal obstacle en Afrique, c'est un, un obstacle financier, mais aussi un, un, un problème d'accès à l'information. À ce jour, l'information a été sporadique, elle n'est pas structurée et elle n'est pas euh, systématique. Et il faut également favoriser un dialogue inclusif euh, au sein de la société civile avec une représentation diversifiée. Concernant euh, comment les euh, rapporteurs de la société civile devraient être euh, sélectionnés, euh, bon, ben les critères euh, évidents de, de compétences, etc., etc., de, de connaissances du, du pacte mondial, mais deux remarques importantes. La première, c'est qu'il faudrait qu'il y ait un comité 
que 5 à 7 personnes ou toutes les régions seraient représentées. Et puis, euh, deuxièmement, qu'il devrait y avoir euh, au minimum deux rapporteurs euh, de genres différents et de régions différentes. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Stéphane. Um, Alma, I, I pass it off to you for, for closing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your time. I know we went over time, uh, but just really wanted to um, just call attention about some of the important um, practices that you raise in terms of uh, model practices, in terms of regularization and social protections for migrants, particularly during COVID. Uh, but while there is some important uh, social protections and, and things that have happened, there are also some important setbacks in regards to human rights, particularly at, at borders. So the IRM, IMRF is an important opportunity for really getting real estate buying into the commitments made within the compact and particularly to reaffirm the centrality of human rights in practice. Uh, we also want to use this opportunity to mobilize uh, support and real engagement for partnerships with civil society uh, and, and UN agencies, you know, to create programs that really protect uh, migrants on the ground. Um, this, this really means, you know, really bringing to the attention of states uh, uh, not only uh, uh, deterring themselves from, you know, just going into the security frameworks, but also, you know, for cooperating towards passing uh, rights-based uh, regularization programs. So thank you very much for your important contributions and analysis. I'm going to pass it on to Colin for helping us close these, these conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alma. First of all, I want to thank Alma and Cicely uh, and Marta um, for moderating and, and co-facilitating this entire session. And uh, I want to send our apologies to Don, who was also supposed to co-facilitate, but had a blackout in his town, uh, so was not able to do that today, But and, and we hope that he, he'll be okay. A big thank you also to all the group moderators and reporters uh, for all the work that you did in terms of the groups and, and for those stepping up uh, when there wasn't anybody in your group to do that. We appreciate it. And a big thanks to our interpreters who have always been helpful in many of our sessions. We, we really appreciate your, your dedication and, and support of us. So thank you for doing that also. Uh, just a quick... Uh, mention about what comes next. First of all, the, this consultation, and, and we really heard a lot of really good questions that were raised, uh, some of the questions that were consistent throughout all the, the breakout groups. We had some really good uh, concerns also and some good ideas that have emerged out of that. Just to say that this consultation, at least this first consultation, was not to answer the questions. And that, that's not the purpose of this person consultation. The purpose was to collectivize um, a lot of the questions, the concerns, the ideas, um, and to put them together and, and consolidate them as, as some of the things that were starting to emerge from civil society around the world. Uh, and so we hope we're starting to do that. And it's just the first step in doing that. What we want to do is then present and discuss and dialogue this first with member states, as you saw from the survey that we went through right at the start of the session, um, dialoguing with member states was very much on the top of the list of, of everybody. And same thing as we discussed within the action committee membership as well, that keeps coming up time and again as something that's really critically important. So we will uh, plan for that and, and collectivize it and organize it in such a way that we're presenting this in an in a open dialogue. Uh, and we hope to call on our co-facilitators again to help us with that. Uh, the plan for that at the moment is that we hope to do a first dialogue with some member states in about a month's time. So next in July, around about, uh, please don't write this down yet, but somewhere around the 21st of July is what we're planning on. And we're reaching out to certain specific member states to help us in, to kick off that first dialogue. So please uh, stay tuned. We will be sending more information about that um, and to bring a lot of these questions, comments, ideas, into that dialogue with member states, but that'll be just the first step. We hope to then come back again, and I, we've heard a number of you mention uh, to focus in on specific themes in the next time we have this discussion within ourselves, 
but also to how can we make the GCM a living document that that really came out very strongly in a number of the breakout groups. So I think that's going to be really important for us to also be able to um, see how we can kind of define that a little bit more. What is it that we want to see? Really flush that out. And a, a number of ideas have really started to emerge. So what we will do is we'll take August as a break, but we'll come back in September or October and plan for a next round of this consultation uh, with all of you and, and with anybody else that uh, from civil society who wants to engage in that, to continue this conversation and to develop that. That's the plan for us to keep going from now until next May to the IMRF to have these consistent, uh, at least two more uh, consultations uh, with civil society at the global level, supporting civil society consultations at the national and regional level. We'll do all we can to support that uh, and to develop engagement and dialogues with member states, uh, with uh, the UN network, with UN specific UN agencies and any other stakeholders in the conversation as well. I think some of the conversation about what does the civil society rapporteur mean and sh that should be one for different stakeholder groups. That's good conversations we can also have with other stakeholder groups that we have partners with. That's the plan at the moment. So please stay tuned. Definitely the next one will come up in uh, by the end of July. We hope to have uh, that secured very, very soon. So we'll inform everybody to save the date and more details about that to come. But for now, we thank you for staying late. We thank you again all for being uh, very engaging in the discussions. And uh, we look forward to talking more with you very, very soon. Thank you and have a good rest of your day.